our chief executive officer, Scott Barry, came to me about two years ago and said, families start like very motivated with our services. Our industry like, has families that jump through a lot of hoops to get to therapy. And he's like, over the years I've seen their motivation like wane once therapy starts. And he, he asked me why. He's like, if this is such a, and he's not a BCBA, so he's such a medically necessary service. Why are they like, they have this hope and promise for this and then we start providing it and then they, they're canceling shifts. They're, they're low utilization. They don't see the, you know, they, they'll go on hold uh, and like not receive service for a period of time. And I presented the data to him. I was just like, like clinically, like we need to improve. At, at the most basic level, look at our behavior intervention plans. The one thing that we should do really well as a science is like, I can geek out and talk about like RFT and like all this advanced language work that we can do. But like at the most basic level, a behavior intervention plan is something that we should be able to do really well. Yeah and across our organization, we weren't. And I, and I don't think that our organization is like an anomaly. I think across our industry, this is an area that we struggle in. And, and partly because some of the technology and tools that are in place, like a standard FA is not something that's happening, right? And, and even if it was, it doesn't scale across the amount of clients that like really need the services. And so at the time I was taking a training from Hanley and I saw you know, something that's safe right in the PFA a safe procedure to do to really understand a client to build a relationship through it one of my fears at being at this level and knowing that I have 3,000 you know clients that could get hurt at any given time is like whatever decision we make we have to ensure that it's safe and so I saw that opportunity that conversation with our chief clinical officer to, to propose like here's a here's a way that we could do that He's of the right mind and the right perspective that if we're ever gonna do something clinically it's not gonna be like a best practice that like just train them on it and then like go out to the world and like if they use it, they use it. If they don't, they don't. And so we've actually baked this into like everything that we're doing. It's a required thing for our, our BCBAs. Every BCBA that we hire starts in a six month mentorship program, specifically being trained by directors who are experts in this to help support them, coach them, guide them with their clients um, to a level of competency that we're comfortable with. All of our technicians are going to get tra getting trained through this and it's gonna form how we start care for all of our clients. That right there is the journey you're talking about and that's, it's hard. The hardest thing that I didn't realize was like gaining alignment across uh, everyone, everyone right? Yeah. Like, um, and I, where we've been successful, um, we have some really great leaders on, on my team. They, they meet with our finance team, they meet with our recruiting team, our credentialing team, um, our compliance team. Everyone in the organization knows what PFA and SBT is why it matters to them in their department and why it matters to our clients. That was actually the easy sell. Um, it's actually our BCBAs that are the harder sell. Um, and, and I get it. Like we were, we were all trained in certain ways by certain people yeah. and, and you've all, and part of this, the reckoning that I had was some like, like it's like histories that collide of like, here's this research that, you know, Hanley's spearheaded and like, and a, a lot of people are running with and like, what I was trained in, um, somewhat different, right? And I thought it was effective, right? Yeah. And I did things that like, now looking back, I'm pretty like ashamed of um, in how I approach certain clients or certain behaviors. And so there, there is this reckoning that I think happens with a lot of people that go through this process. Yeah. And it's also just changing your practice is work. And we're in an industry that really taxes a lot of our, our professionals. And so we're, we're as a team, what we're working on is figuring out like, how can we make this like the least effortful for our, our staff yeah. while ensuring that we can still like provide the care that we need to provide. We're like six months into a journey um, and I'm sure we have years ahead before we really like see this through. How's it going so far? Oh, it's been, right now I'm really happy and proud. Um, hasn't always been that, that way. Uh, that conversation I, that I told you with my chief clinical officer or my chief executive officer was a long time ago <laughs> and we've learned and failed to get to this point um, first thing I did was like I reached out to Greg and I'm like hey like we need help and uh, we got some clinical directors we got some supervising clinicians or BCBAs on our teams put them together with FTF and we did some really great work with them and we had some really great data with our clients but you can't scale an initiative through consultants. Yeah. Like you need internal yeah. leadership oh, 
to actually own this and run with this. Yeah. And I didn't have that. Yeah. And what it also did was like just the, there were some barriers in our like organizational structure, our technology that didn't allow for us to like move forward. We have our own software that we use um, and no, I have a whole product team that we were managing in software development and and I'm excited about it because we can tailor that software to our needs, yeah. but it takes, some time. It takes time. Yeah. And you can't scale an initiative at our size with pen, pencil and paper. Um, it has to be you know really part of the technology system that we have. So we had to like invest into our technology system. Um, we had to look at every aspect of training, development, support systems. Um, and knowing that, you know, I was talking about our, our industry having professionals that are taxed and like they work really hard is being able to demonstrate the impact of this work to an organization so that we can invest in, I have a team of six people right now that aren't making any billable dollars, right, for yeah. the company. Yeah. All they do is support people. Yeah. And so we had to prove that that was actually a sustainable model. Sure. Um, highly trained. Highly trained, yeah. competent, yeah. and like candidly, the, the, some of the struggles that we have in our industry is we have people who like, is a challenge to go from like concept to like operationalizing it and executing it. And like, I have a really great group of people that know exactly what PFA and SBT is, how, like what good looks like, and then how are we gonna like scale that across the organization. Yeah. From the, the start with this initiative, we went through a nine month like just pause while we learned and struggled and failed. Yeah. And then it really wasn't until I hired Hillary Laney, our VP, to like, yeah. she's been a catalyst to like, be that internal leader and internal champion to like drive this change. That's cool. I got to sit down and talk with her and she was saying that uh, same thing. It was everyone in the organization needs to know what we're doing, why we're doing it, um, and getting that across to everybody. Especially in a large organization, there's decisions being made every day that I'm not part of. That impact. That, that impact that I'm too. doing. Yeah. And like I need, so I need my CFO to know <laughs> what PFA and SPT is, yeah. why these directors are important. Yeah. Right, why we're not going to bill for any of their time, yeah. and even why we have an ROI on that, yeah. um, right? And then everyone in the organization cares about our, the clients that we serve and the impact that we're having, but um, there's a whole lot of aspects to like running a business that this initiative impacts, and like I think it needs to be clear to everyone like why we're doing it and what the outcomes are. What's really exciting for you in the field right now? Um, could be related to Centria's yep. work as well. Yep. Um, and like, what needs to be done? Like, what are you eager to see accomplished? I think the biggest thing that excites me right now in the industry is our move towards like values-based like payment models um, and outcomes-based payment models. So, we're investing we're investing a lot in it. I'm spending a lot of time in this because um, we have a system um, that really was constructed by a, people who advocated for hours of therapy, right? So we had families who were wanting ABA therapy, research that showed that hours or what you know, wasn't necessary, and this whole system's been constructed out of that construct. Um, and hours are like definitely like necessary, but they're not sufficient, right? Like I- They're like a parameter. Right? They're a parameter. Like I told my Tim, I, I spent hours at the gym. Yeah. You would never know it, right? It's like, it's the quality of those hours and like yeah, what yeah. you do at the gym. Um, and and I, I think setting a framework that like looks at like outcomes and meaningful outcomes is, an important step forward for us as an industry. I get a little nervous when we have like hundreds of payers that might have a, a very different set of outcomes around like what what's meaningful to them because that, that becomes a very hard thing for us to manage. Um, but, uh, and, and Greg alluded to this, I think today in one of the talks, which was, and what, what we're seeing in PFA and SBT implementation is that it's so much more than behavior reduction. We said an eighth grader, like he's and banned for the first time. Um, like we didn't target playing the drum or singing, but now we've, we've he, he's gotten to a place to where like he's willing to take risks and, and go into a new environment. We had a, f a family in Oregon reach out saying they went to their to dinner for the first time with their seven year old and were able to sit and enjoy a dinner. That wasn't something we targeted, right? That's just like this collateral like you know effect of, of the service that we're providing. Something so simple that you can take for granted, it can be absolutely life changing. For a life changing, like that, right? yeah. 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 Um, having a, a parent report that uh, for the first time she could make dinner and not worry about their child while their child was just in their room playing yeah. and they were safe for a 30 minute period of time. Yeah. There's like these very meaningful life impacting like face valid outcomes that are starting to occur as a function of this work. And I think 
to me that connects with this values-based you know, approach because those are the meaningful types of outcomes that we need to start to look at um, and drive towards. I'm, my background's like, I have a heavy focus on curriculum and instruction and intervention. I can like geek out with like whatever like criterion reference tools that we're using and talk about this relational frame or this objective in the peak, right? But at the end of the day, none of that really matters. What matters is like how that impacts yeah. a client, their family, the community they live in. Um, and that's, I think, part of this movement is, is really about, is like these, these are people um, within, within a life, within a family, within a community, and the work that we can, or we're doing is like, should impact yeah. that in a very socially valid and meaningful way. That values-based approach, yeah. is that, uh, I don't know this area, but I know it's been yeah. talked about at some conferences amongst different uh, leaders in ABA. Is that, uh, the value-based pay models yeah. that you're talking about yeah. there. Can you describe those to me? I, I don't know outside of they're being talked about. Yeah. Can you describe them to me? So it means a, different things to different people. Okay. So I'll say that. And I, I think it's application in our industry could look, you know, significantly different okay. depending on what direction it goes. But in essence, um, uh, right now we're paid for the most part for these process metrics, uh, like utilization, hours, you know, hours build. Um, is, is the main one. Outcomes-based payment plan or a values-based payment model looks at like what are the meaningful outcomes, patient satisfaction, um, uh, meaningful like progress in like specific domains of, you know, yeah. of, of impact. Um, actual outcomes. Actual right? outcomes. Yeah. So what, we, what I've looked at it as and, and what we've defined like what our outcome set at Century is, is it's around four key pillars. Um, we want to provide access to care. So one meaningful outcome is that when clients get referred to care, they get into care. Um, and so we've set a goal of like 45 days being our standard. So when we get a referral, we want start of care to be, occur within 45 days. Um, we have families that wait months, sometimes years in yeah. some of our markets, right? And that's, that's not an outcome that any client wants. Um, we look at f uh, continuity of care. So once they get into service, are we providing the service at a in a way that's stable, consistent, with uh, technician retention being a significant challenge right now, like that consistency is a problem, um, and that's that's an outcome that's not um, beneficial for any client or family. And then we look at fidelity. So we have a, a way that we measure, like, so we we got them into care, we are providing the care, but is the care that we're providing actually aligned to like? what was prescribed. And so we, we, we measure that on a daily basis. So right now I could tell you of the 3,000 sessions that happened yesterday, what percentage of them hit our quality standards as aligned to what we prescribed. And the last one is the one that we're really talking about is impact of care. So all three of these, those things are great, but if they're not like actually impacting the, the client, then we're just wasting people's time. And so we've defined a set of standard outcome sets. We Part of it, we partnered with ICHOM, which is a, a international consortium that looked at like what are some standard outcome sets for children with autism? The BHCOE has a framework that aligns with ours as well. Like what are some like very like meaningful milestones that all clients should have? Like all of our clients should be safe um, in their home, in their community, and, and engage in behaviors that like are productive. Um, all clients have the you know the right to have a voice that they can use, a way to communicate meaningfully, and there's a variety of them, but like looking at very specific big picture milestones that you know, in, in, in some ways are like cusps that like access, allow them to access reinforcers in, in new and meaningful ways. It's, it's uh, exciting to me. I don't, like I said, I don't dabble in thinking about it much, but it's exciting to me to think about uh, how people are trying to consider, like let's line up some of the financial incentives with yeah. the outcomes here, because it's simple 101 in OBM yeah. where you start. It's very hard to implement those for things. Sure. It's extremely hard yeah. if you're gonna go across an industry. So uh, that's cool. Thank you yeah. for that. Well, behavior flows where reinforcement occurs, right? Yeah. So like you put reinforcement on the things that matter, yep. like behaviors the behaviors align. are gonna start to align to yeah. that. And I think that's one of the things that like ails our industry is, um, and I, I'm, I'm pretty bullish on this, 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 uh, this idea and this, where our industry can go with this approach, is right now we have ABA graduate students being trained everywhere, right? In a variety of different practicum programs, looking at a variety of different things. A generalist certificate that it is. And ABA therapy can be a lot of different things. Yeah. 
to a lot of different people and a lot of different companies and um, we're not doing anyone any benefit to people who want to go into this specific industry, right? Like I'm not saying just the BCB at, at large, but like this specific industry, it would behoove us to like, this is what we're trying to accomplish in this industry. Here's what we think meaningful outcomes look like for children with autism or individuals with autism. Yeah. Like how can we start to align some of the systems that like help support yeah. and develop the... Maybe moving to some subspecialties over time. For sure. Like this, right? But that only occurs when you have a very clear, like if I'm a physical therapist, I know what to do when I have, you know, a, a torn ACL that's getting repaired, right? Like there's a very clear set of outcomes for that. Yeah. Um, we, we, we are so immature in our field that we don't have that clarity. Yeah. I've heard loosely, Ed was saying that y'all are developing a uh, mentorship program yeah. out there. Like, tell me what that's about. Yeah, that's so one of our failures that we had initially was uh, we have uh, 40 clinical directors all across the country, and we were going to use them as our like avenue for change within this this uh, initiative of BFA and SPT being rolled out. On the surface, thinking back, how it was a pretty th dumb thought. Like, let me take a 40-hour employee who's probably working 50 hours, yeah, right? Yeah. I'm going to add more work to them while they develop this expertise that they probably don't have with clients that they don't have, right? Um, and expect them to then train their 12, you know, supervising clinicians under them that are also taxed. <laughs> and um, and then at the time I was like, well, why, why don't they want to do this, right? <laughs> like, yeah. this is the like great stuff. Like we're like changing lives, we're doing good work. And it's just like, just one of the harsh realities that I had to learn, which is like, everyone wants to do good work, but like there's only so much time in the, in the day, right? And we're already asking so much. Um, and so uh, we took a different approach and we hired um, some directors. Uh, initially it was two directors who came out and they're gonna be mentors. Um, and so what they've done, uh, we have four now under Hillary's leadership is develop this like training curriculum. And I use the word training probably in the wrong way because most people think of training like they think of something different. Like, in a chair. Yeah, we're we're not lecturing. Like we're 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 teaching. Some, or there is some education to it, but then it's also work consulting with them while they're working with a client, yeah, while they're seeing a client. We're coaching them. Yeah. We're we're taking them through the PFA and SDP, SPT process in a very guided, supported, and structured way. Um, because uh, um, I think candidly, like the the ten hour module that you were part of and, yeah. and, and Greg did is, is probably the best online training that I've ever like experienced and it's why I'm here, but there's still more support that's needed For sure. after that. I think like you were saying, like there's, uh, there's going to be different solutions for different uh, organizational uh, goals or like, yeah. you know, as you're trying to implement things like. We're trying to take every single BCBA that we hire, right? <laughs> to become like, yeah. to become like competent in this process. Yeah. Some of our, BC some of our supervising clinicians that we hire are still in grad school, yeah. right? Some of them just, got their certificate. Yeah. Um, and and most of them have reported to us that they need a lot of help in working with clients that have challenging behavior. Yeah. And so for us, mentorship was the only way yeah. to go about, uh, about this. And we have four directors now. I could easily see us having eight directors at some point. Um, they're active, each one of them are actively mentoring 30 supervising clinicians yeah. across a 16 month period yeah. um, with weekly consults and training. And, coaching that's cool yeah like uh any training any like video for example it's just like a it's a tool in the toolbox of things that you can implement yeah. but like when you're talking about it, like a full treatment package in my kid in like my, my head right now of an organization and trying to turn the ship like this yeah. uh you need a lot of stuff there and you need to like potentially rethink everything top to bottom yeah. and the mentorship stuff is really cool because uh and that's where a lot of uh frankly badass behavior analysts came from was rolling up their sleeves for yeah two, three, five, ten years with other behavior analysts. Yep. Like if you get to know the people that are oftentimes rightfully so put up on pedestals in our field because of like their chops clinically, yeah. and you learn like, oh, they spent eight years right alongside somebody. It wasn't yep. it wasn't just kind of a quick thing. So I was talking to I was talking to Ed about that just just real quick. Like yeah. we're we're gonna be rolling out PFA and SPT across thousands of clients. Yeah. Our mentors are gonna be part of almost all of those. And the types of learning 
that's going to occur, right? Like we sit down and look at research studies that have like a couple participants, right? Yeah. Or and, and there's more. And I think some of the, like the I think it's up to 27. The one of the latest studies where they did consecutively yeah. chained and, and like and saw the impact of this work. But like every client you work with is an opportunity to learn yeah. and evolve the process, refine your thinking, yeah. develop a better skill set, yeah. and. I'm very excited about what's ahead with our mentors as they do that across thousands of clients. I saw that she had a presence at the poster poster session yeah. last night, and uh, that's cool. Like, keep that going. Oh, There's for sure. A lot of opportunities there to pump some posters out. Very excited, out and they were all. I'm, I'm very proud of their work. That's um, cool. And one of those posters was just this uh, at our Dearborn Center in, in Michigan. We conducted 17 PFAs in one day. Um, we have 20 20 clients in SBT, and then across a week that we that we had this full just push yeah. and every single one was safe. Yeah. Everyone, everyone was successful in identifying like what the EOs were and how we could start SBT. And uh, when you look at like trying to shift the culture, like yeah. doing it in, in a dense way like that yeah. makes a big impact. Yeah, that's cool. Well, congrats on all this. Thanks. I'm eager to check in on what's going on. Oh, for sure. Cool. I'm yeah. Timothy Yeager, Chief Clinical Officer of Century Healthcare. Mm -hmm.